George C. Thomas Jr. arrived in Southern California in 1920. He had served in World War I and been shaken by his experience, and he found the climate in Los Angeles pleasant and healthy. Since he had family money, he was able to focus on his hobbies, cultivating roses, fishing in the Pacific Ocean, playing golf, and designing golf courses. Within a decade after he moved, he and his associate Billy Bell had created several of the best golf courses, not just in the region, but in the country. His three most famous designs were Bel Air, Riviera, and the site of the 2023 US Open, the North Course at Los Angeles Country Club. LA was Thomas's home club, and when he joined, it was in the midst of a transition. Well, there were three key phases for the club when they moved to this location. There was the first course they built uh, in, in the, the, the early teens. Then they decided to expand to 36 holes. Herbert Fowler on his tour of America stopped in, gave his assessment and, and wrote letters from the train and created models according to his uh, correspondences explaining what he wanted. And then George Thomas, the new member, and Ed Tufts, the club co-founder and sort of a legendary, lovable Southern California golf figure, uh, supervised the creation of Fowler's course. Fowler wasn't there. And that was in 1921. And then massive changes in golf architecture over the next five, six years, and major changes in the understanding of what, what good golf could be in Southern California led to the third phase, which was the 1927, uh, 1928 overhaul of the North while people were still playing the, the other course. Talking about LA North's design, could you just start by describing the property that this course sits on? Yeah, the property uh, for LA North is it's a couple of ridges basically bisected by, by a barranca. You start off obviously up here on this on the plateau where the clubhouse is, and then you know your your transition down into the valley is, is a walking one. You don't play down into it, you walk down to the second hole. And then you're just meandering your way up, right? Two, three, four, five, uh, fours down but you're, constantly, you're working your way to that high point. And you play off it on six, and then you're working your way down seven, eight, and then you're back up onto the plateau on nine. And then the back nine you're setting up and you're just kind of playing mostly along the high ground. But you're, you're tackling some of the, the bigger ups and downs, certainly on 13, you've got that opportunity. And then, you know, then you're along the, the top until you finally, you, you play down through 17 and you know the original design 18 was a blind shot up onto the plateau but then he changed that and put it up so you're up on the, on the plateau so I, I think it's a great way to meander through the property and, and certainly you get enough variety that you don't always feel like hey, you're constantly going in one direction. George Thomas liked to open his courses with a, a getaway hole an easy par five and then and then wake you up with a hard par four and it was probably the one thing that he seemed just absolutely uh, almost obsessed with and he just felt like that was the best way to start around both from a golf point of view and a pace of play point of view so he wanted you to have that par five and and take your uh, take your swings and your hacks and if you're ready to go you make a birdie and then but he's gonna hit you and he did it at, at Bel Air, Riviera and LA got you a nice getaway three-shotter and then you know slapped you around on that second hole and those those second holes are all uh, are were all really difficult but in terms of underrated at la north I, I feel like the third hole even in the modern game with where players hit it some of the the, the landforms are just extraordinary of the shadows and the look of it and yeah it's essentially it's an uphill hole which isn't usually a whole lot of fun to play, but there's something about it, the combination of, of everything. And then you get up to the green, and it is a green that will be treated probably a little bit differently in US Open conditions, because it's that severe. But if you look at it, the shape of it, we call it the molar shaped green, because it looks like an extracted tooth, and it has these two wings in the front, and kind of wings in the back, and there are all these different hole locations. But this, this uh, land that it's on is just this massive canvas with these huge slopes. 
And then you turn around and there's Century City. And it's just uh, the setting of it, the stage of it is just magnificent. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be a place to, to watch during the US Open because that green is a little bit scary. I think my favorite stretch would be six, seven, eight. Uh, I just, I love, I think six is just a brilliant golf hole. I, that's, you know, people have asked me which hole you're gonna sit and want to, and that's the hole I want to watch because, you know, it's a, it's a short hole obviously, and but you can't see the target off the tee. And so it's one of these things of, okay, mentally, how do you get yourself set to take on a challenge that you can't see, which I think is always challenging for better players to do that. The options to lay up are clear, but they feel so alien because you're like, you know the green's there, why do I want to play way over here? There are certain hole locations where you don't want to try and drive that green. And there are certain hole locations where you want to get as far left as you can to kind of play back up the length of the green. And will they figure that out you know, over a short period of time or will they just figure, oh, I'm just going to bomb it up there and I can get up and down from wherever I'm going and I don't think they, they will. Uh, then you go from there into seven, one of his hybrid holes, which they're going to play as a par three. They're not going to do the hybrid thing, which I think is smart. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, it could be played as a short par four to a certain hole location. But I think the, the length of that hole, the opening in the front of the green, the way it sits in there, the beauty of the barranca. So, you know, it's the start of the barranca cutting across six and then how it winds its way down the left-hand side of seven and then eight how you know, it crosses underneath and then it re-emerges and plays down the right-hand side for the tee shot and then cuts across and plays down the left-hand side for the second shot. So I think the incorporation of the Branca into those three holes, the beauty of the Sycamores on number eight, I think the setting for that golf hole is amazing. So I think there are three holes that are probably, with the exception of 17, the prettiest golf holes on the golf course. But also from a strategy, it's a really nice run of short four, long three, short five. As you get into the back nine, I think the flow of that is it's just, it's phenomenal. 10 is a good, good opportunity to score at 11, uh, hard. 12 short, but the green is really severe. But in my mind, this finishing stretch starts on 13. I mean, another hole that's underrated that I think could be controversial as well, if players don't understand it, um, is the 13th hole. You've gone on this front nine through this kind of meandering, sort of pathy type of set of holes, and and now the back nine, it's just, everything's big. And you're up higher, you've got the sea breeze into you. This hole is an absolute beast. It will, it will play as the toughest hole in the US Open, I have no doubt. Um, but what makes it fascinating is the fairway is gonna be about 75 to 80 yards wide, which in the US Open is, is almost unfathomable, but, you have to hit it in about a 25 yard slot up the left side if you wanna see the green. You can hit it down the middle all day, but the ball will roll down. You will have a blind second shot. And you wanna see into this green because it's probably the sneakiest green on the course in terms of pitch. But from the fairway, it just looks pretty simple. So there's no excuse for not hitting the green, but if you're above the hole on any putt there, Look out, it is, um, it is absolutely a devilish, devilish green. So I think that hole being as difficult as it is based primarily on the contour and the slope of the ground is really where you start to, to finish. And most players of this caliber, you know, think of par fives, okay, we're definitely gonna reach in two. 14 is not really one of those holes. And I'm not even sure you'd be smart to go for it in two based on the severity around that green. So you're going to have an, I don't think you're going to see a lot of eagles there and, and you know, I think birdies are going to, it's still a demanding shot into that green. Then 15, depending on how they set it up is, you know, is it a short par three, but you've got to hit an exacting shot, especially if the whole location's on that front portion of the green. And then 16, 17, 18 are just tough like tough, tough, tough in a row. And, and not only because of the length, it's the greens themselves, it's the demands of the tee shot. Um, you know, I think it's, you, we're not gonna see a lot of uh, birdie, birdie, birdie for somebody to catch somebody or, or take the lead on the last three holes. I think we're gonna see that, you know, sort of quintessential U.S. slugfest, U.S. Open slugfest coming down the stretch where you're gonna have to really, you know, par is gonna be highly valued.
Well, LA North evolved in several ways over the time that uh, spanned from when George Thomas had passed away to when uh, we eventually got our hands on it. You know, architecturally, the biggest thing was three holes were radically changed. The, the sixth green was essentially bulldozed over and moved up the hill, and then the second green was moved up a hill and made a par five so that the eighth hole could be a longer par five. Uh, and I played those holes and many times and they were all, you know, just not great. They weren't clearly as good as what Thomas had done and, and people recognized there was something wrong with them. And then, like many courses, it became over-treed uh, and, and uh, just, just all sorts of non-native trees and people kept planting them. Uh, and it got to the point where it was very hard to grow grass at times. So by the time that we got the chance to present a master plan, it had a lot of problems. It had everything imaginable going against it from architectural to agronomic. So they decided at some point that it was time to consult an architect again. And the general manager at the time, Kirk Reese, had me over one day and I met with a committee and uh, I was able to, I think, speak for George Thomas as best as one can <laughs> without him being there, that they really had something special. Not only if you just kind of, if you view this as an old painting and get the dust off and see the painting, but then, you know, they had other things that if you put it in the right lighting and the right setting, it really pops. And I don't think those elements they fully understood, so I, explain that and uh, when it came time uh, to seek architects I had worked with Gil uh, on Rustic Canyon so we were kind of a, an obvious team. So I'm not sure about the exact date whether it was 2005 or 2006 but we, we came in here we kind of walked into the, the room understanding the significance of this golf course but also of, of this club and just said listen if if you don't want to restore George Thomas we're not your guys. We delivered that message very clearly. I think that resonated with the membership here because it's a club that's been very proud of its traditions and its history. And, and so we were selected, we did a master plan for the North course, uh, went through a variety of town hall meetings. So we finally got approval from the membership uh, in 2008, we were supposed to start and the financial crisis hits. Uh, and so I remember getting a call from Barclay Perry, the president, saying we're, we're going to have to stop. We started to talk about, okay, is there a portion of the project we could do that would not disrupt play and still move things forward? And so we all agreed we would do the fairway bunkers. Jeff's importance in this cannot be underestimated because anytime we needed information or, or sort of documentation, he had it. Right, and so we had the best archi archivist, but he also was an amazing set of eyes to help us make sure that, that we were getting things in an authentic fashion. Well, one of the things you see with Thomas and Bell courses, each course they got more dramatic with their bunker style. And in essence, it was an eroded edge, uh, you know, fringy, almost like a baseball glove shape. A lot like what McKinsey did, you know, sort of a, based on the, the, the look of a floating cloud where the bottom's kind of quiet and the edges are very fringy. But getting this look was tough. So we built a test bunker back behind the sixth green. Got all these different grasses. And we came up with different grasses to, to create little stacked lips just to see what worked the best. And ultimately, the tall fescue grass with the fine fescue stacked in different numbers and, and that was a big part of the project for me was to to paint the, the the lines to fine tune those to paint the number of pieces of sod we would stack so they varied and they just looked like they had gotten old and the effect was to make this is an old course and so many restorations you look at the place looks brand new and we didn't want it to look brand new. We wanted this to look old, to have a patina to it that, that was made you say, well, this is an old place, it's an old course. And um, it'll be interesting to see these don't have liners. Um, they're very thick. That tall fescue is tough around the greens. It'll be very interesting to see what the players uh, say about these bunkers because they're, they're true hazards.
And so we came in and we did the fairway bunkers in uh, 2009. And honestly, in hindsight, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. Um, we proved what we were hoping to accomplish as far as Thomas's work was concerned. You know, anyone who was skeptical about it could at least now have visual proof of what we were trying to do. And, and I think the sentiment was overwhelmingly positive. It allowed us building upon that confidence in the membership to go back and I say, all right, there were a few things that got left uh, behind, you know, restoring the second hole, restoring the sixth green, restoring the eighth green, putting those holes back to Thomas. And I think based on the, the momentum we had built, the membership said, okay, great, let's go forward with that. And so it became the full-fledged restoration that we had always hoped it would be, but because of various reasons didn't occur. To take LA North back to where it was or beyond, it was essential to get the Barrancas back to being rugged, sandy. You don't know what you're gonna get when you find your ball. We want you to find the ball, um, but we, we, we don't want it to be easy. And the, the Barranca had become, in a lot of places, just very tightly mown Bermuda grass. And they were not inspiring. They were not dramatic or hazardous in any way and it, it was a thrill for us to try to get that back and it's been thrilling to see how people have responded and it's the thing that I think also just visually makes the course so incredible when you're in you know you're in the middle of the city you know you see you see glimpses of the high rises or you see these views and you you hear the occasional city life in the form of sirens or helicopters and then you look down and there are these 200-year-old sycamore trees with odd shapes and they're growing in this barranca that you know has, has been there and they, they worked around and used in the creation and recreation of the course. And that juxtaposition of the two is just unlike anything else in the world of golf. It's uh, so fascinating. I can't wait to see how it looks on, on television with the, everything that comes with a major championship.